G'day everybody, Nick Dingle here again for another VB.NET 2013 tutorial. In the last video we looked at inheritance and polymorphism for classes and in this one we're going to take it a little bit further and finish it up with overriding, overloading operators and also overriding original functions from Visual Basic and probably bringing in just a concept of what's called a deconstructor because I haven't mentioned that yet, or destructor I should say. And um, I probably should mention him at the very least. We just He's not very useful for the example that I'm using. So for example, I'm actually going to stick with the C rectangle class for this video. So I'm going to minimize the cube fella. And we're going to come down to this blank space that I've made. And we're going to start. So with operators, you use them all the time when you're working with integers and strings and booleans and things like that. And for example, it's when I do things like if A is great. Oh, sorry. I'm just going to make an error for myself. If A equals 5, then do stuff. So this guy right here is an operator. And what if we wanted to make our own operator? What if we wanted to check if rect1 is equal to rect2 for whatever reason? Now, by default, there is no operator for our custom classes. So we have to define our own. So I'm just going to get rid of this code for a moment, and we're going to come back to this guy. And let's go to the class and start creating some of our operators. Now, it's actually very, very easy. And it's also bringing in another concept. Now, we used shared keyword up here for shape count to share a variable among every single rectangle and every class that inherits a rectangle and, their, and so forth. So what we're going to do now is we're going to create a shared operator, which can be used for any rectangle class in the future. So what we do to declare it, let's start with the equals one, because that's quite easy. We're going to check if one rectangle is equal to another rectangle. So we go public shared operator. And look at this, you've got so many different operators to choose from. If you don't know what some of these actually do, then I'd suggest you have a look at, just Google them, have a look at the Microsoft documentation, they're always thorough. However, let's just stick with the equals fella. And what you actually have to do is you have to have two parameters because with an equal sign, you have one on the left and one on the right. And by default, they're usually called A as a C rectangle and B as a C rectangle. And then we're going to go as a Boolean because we're going to return true or false if it equals. Now, there's an error and there's a warning. Don't worry about either of them. Let's have a look at what this A and this B is for the moment. If we were to do a quick if statement here, then rect1 would be the value of A and rect2 would be the value for b. All right? We're checking if rect1 is equal to rect2. So what you need to ask yourself is what actually would make them the same. So realistically, we don't care about the shape count. We don't care about the area. What we do care about is the width and the height. So if the width of a and b are the same and the height of a and b are the same, then they are actually the same kind of rectangle, are they? So we're actually going to set up ourselves an if statement here, and we're going to check if the width and the height of either are different. Okay, well, uh, realistically, let's do it the easy way. Let's check if they're the same. So if A's width equals B's width and A's height is equal to B's height, then they're the same, aren't they? Because if they've got the same width and they've got the same height, then we're going to return true. Okay, now if either of those is not true, if the width is different or the height is different, then they're not the same. So we're going to return false. All right. And that's pretty much it. That's all the code that you need for your equals operator. However, we've still got this error up here and it says matching does not equal operator is required. So if you're going to implement an equals operator, you must have a does not equals one. Okay. So let's copy this top line here and implement our does not equals symbol. A couple of lines, paste, does not equal. All right. Error's gone away, but we need to actually implement some code for this guy. Now, I'm a bit of a lazy bugger. I could just copy and paste this code here and make it opposite. So if the width does not equal or the height does not equal, then we return true. However, we've already implemented an equals, and a does not equals is realistically the opposite of an equals. So what you do straight away is you return the opposite, which is a not of A equals B. So what I mean by that is we're checking if A equals B in this one here, and then we're making it opposite. And that's it. That's all the code you need for your does not equal operator. Now, before we finish up with operators and actually finalize this video, 
Probably one that we should really look at is like your add operator. So operator plus. Okay, so we're adding two rectangles together. So let's copy this because I'm lazy. All right, again, you need to think about what's going to happen. Well, what we're going to do is we're going to take the width of A and the width of B and the height of A and the height of B and add them together and return them as a whole new rectangle. So whoop, I need to change this return value. It's not going to be a Boolean. It's going to be a new rectangle. It's just like if you take the number 5 and add the number 8, you get 13, which is a whole new number. So we're going to add the first rectangle onto the second rectangle and return a whole new rectangle. All right, and I'm going to be nice and lazy, and we're going to do this in one line of code. Quite simple, because we've set up a constructor which takes a width and a height, we can actually utilize that in one line. So return a new C rectangle, and we're going to pass it the width, and we're going to pass it the height. The new width is going to be A's width plus B's width, and the height is going to be A's height plus B's height. And there you go. That's the plus operator done. I'm not going to implement any other ones. I'm going to leave it entirely up to you if you want to do the minus times and divide. All right, but that is there how you implement an equals, a does not equals, and a plus operator for your own custom class. I hope that helps out, and I hope you can utilize it in some way in the future. Now, there are other ones that you should probably do, like greater than and equal to, oh, sorry, greater than and least than and things like that. But I'm going to entirely leave to you as a challenge to try and implement that one. Let's minimize these three guys, and there's our three operators done. Let's have a go at them for a sec. So rect 1, he is 10 and 50. Rect 2 is 20 and 15. So if they equal each other, right line, rect 1 and rect 2 are the same. Now let's put in an else, because if they're not the same, not the same. I'm just going to quickly comment these guys because I don't need it anymore. Let's test out our equals operator. Make sure he works. They are not the same. Let's make them the same, 10 and 50. Woohoo! Plain old works. All right, so there's your operators done and dusted. Now, I mentioned something about overriding functions which are already built in. One that's very particularly important is the two string function that is included in every single object in for the entirety of visual basic and c++ and c sharp for um, visual studio sorry <clears throat> jumping all over my words here realistically let's just type in overrides there are three you've got equals you've got get hash code and to string by default if you use to string for this bad boy okay i'm literally just going to get rid of this code for the moment because that was just a demo Let's get rid of these guys as well. I feel a bit sad getting rid of all this code that I've written. Let's just do rect one dot two string and see what comes up. If you've tried this stuff before, you probably already know what's going to happen. Console application five, which is the namespace, and then C rectangle, which is the object that it is. So that's the default to string. It gives you what the object is. Now realistically, maybe I want to see the width and the height come up instead. So let's implement it that way. Without changing any code in module one, let's go to rectangle and override the original to string. Now, this return my base to string is actually what's causing the problem. The my base to string is what's returning console application 5.c rectangle. So let's get rid of that bad boy and let's put in our own thing. I'm going to go width, um, let's say colon, that, that, that looks nice. Add the width onto it. And then the height, and put the height on the end of it. Okay, we're just changing that one function. If I press play, automatically changes width and height. And I can do that for every single rectangle that I've got. So I can be a little bum. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five. Oh my god, this is taking longer than it should. Press play. And you can see it's individual for every single class because we've overridden it. And that is overriding. Done and dusted. It's very, very powerful and I suggest you use it. It's actually particularly powerful 
when it comes to debugging your console programs. Right? So I suggest you have a go at it, you utilize it a little bit, and you see what you can do with overriding the to string or whatever like that. All right, and the last thing that I mentioned was a destructor. So destructor is exactly how it sounds. It's the complete opposite of a constructor. So a constructor is utilized when the new keyword is used. Destructor is used when the destroy or the dispose function is used. All right, the easiest way to get it, like before I just typed in public sub new, you can easily click up here with declarations and click on finalize. So that's your destructor in Visual Basic. And to be completely honest, if you were using other objects, if you were allocating your own memory, if you were using complicated variables, this is where you destroy all of your memory. And it's a really good idea to have a destructor in your pro, um, sorry, in all of your classes. Now, because we're using integers, which are self-managed by Visual Basic, they will be handled in the mybase.finalize. We won't actually have to implement any finalizations. So, if you ever utilize any byte arrays, if you ever utilize dynamic arrays or lists, this is where you would destroy them. Okay, make sure you do because it's extremely important that you remove it. Because if you don't use a destructor, then you're going to get memory leaks. You're going to have different issues with your program using more memory than it really should in the long run. Now, bear in mind, final final note that I'll mention about destructors before I go is that when you call a finalize function or a dispose function, okay, so for example, calling a dispose function is rect1 dot, should be just dot dispose, but apparently I'm too dumb to realize that by default doesn't exist. Anyway, calling a dispose function or a finalize function doesn't destroy the memory straight away. What it does is it marks it for deletion. And then what's called the garbage collection function, or garbage collection built into Visual Studio will come along at a set time, have a look at everything that's marked for deletion, and then remove it from memory. So it doesn't get removed straight away. It gets removed every so often. I suggest you have a read up on that if it's really important to you to know about garbage collection and destructors. All right, I hope that made some sense. I hope you learned something about operators and overriding existing functions because I'm leaving you there with classes and we're done. In the next videos, we're going to explore databases in a big, big way. We're going to have a look at how you implement databases and what they really are in the next couple of videos. But otherwise, I'd like you to thank you for joining me. If you have any questions to ask, put them down below. If you have any suggestions or corrections, again, put them below. Please like the video if you do actually like it. And I'll see you in the next one. Thank you for joining me. This is Nick Dingle. See you later, everyone.